But um, if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Acts 16. A lot of the verses are going to be up there on, on the screen that we're going to be reading. Not all of them, though, so it's just better if we turn there. And uh, I mean, um, uh, and, and it's not going to be the typical uh, missionary message, okay? I know that as missionaries, we're supposed to come in and talk about missions and, and, and taking the gospel to the other most parts of the world. And, and you will, I feel, at the end of the day, that that burden will be conveyed. But what, this time around, after so long of, of not being uh, on furlough and reporting to the churches, I mean, we've had a, a long-standing battle with stage four cancer, and we beat it three times uh, by the power of God and by his grace alone. <laughs> well, and by your prayers, and by your prayers. And, uh, but, uh, but it's like, I, I want to come through the churches, and I just want to inject some excitement, some enthusiasm, some uh, um, hope, and, uh, and, and, and having lived in three different countries uh, with three different um, languages, um, th- there are some subjects of school growing up that I hated, okay? Now, just imagine, first, you're learning all the history that there is uh, about the Vikings and all the hundreds of kingdoms and how El Grande that came to uh, to conquer all those and, and bring them to one and all these dates and, and the real Viking that discovered America before Christopher Columbus. Uh, and my second born is named after him, Eric. And, uh, and so uh, all these dates. Then we go to the States and now it's George Washington and it's uh, Lincoln and, and, and the battles against the Brits and, 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 and the independence. And then boom, now we're back into Mexico and Mexican history is the worst. <laughs> it is so confusing. Mexicans don't even understand it. I'm serious. It's like, when was the independence? When, well, it started here as an idea, but it, it wasn't like 11 years. But we celebrate when it was the idea. So, but it did, I mean, it, the revolution, and it, it is so confusing. So I hated history. <laughs> that was not my subject. But imagine, doesn't matter what language, can you guess what subject I enjoyed? Let's go to the next one. Let's... <laughs> next slide, next slide, next slide. There. Math. Why? Because it doesn't matter what language it is, it looks the same. <laughs> and it does the same, right? It's consistent. I mean, two plus two is three, no matter where you are. <laughs> oh, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I, I know it's five. But, but uh, I remember being in, in, in Mexico and my dear short little teacher just explaining the whole formula on the, on, on the uh, blackboard. And like, I'm sure she gave a great explanation. I just didn't understand it. So what I had to do is reverse engineer. Okay, that's the result. Now, how did she get that? And so I'd go backwards and once I understand the formula... I got it. There's not a problem I can't solve because you got the formula down, right? Well, that's what I want to do. Now that we're going to different churches, I want to teach you conversion. Not from uh, fractions to decimals, but I want you, I want to help uh, you to convert afflictions into blessings. You know, let's turn the afflictions because Let's be, let's be honest, while we're here on this earth, that's one guarantee Jesus gave us. In this world, you will have tribulations. You will have afflictions. You will have problems. So we know that's an unlimited source <laughs> that we're going to have here on earth. So imagine if someone invented how to turn trash into gold. That'd be a pretty cool thing, right? Because we all have trash. And we could turn the trash into gold. That would be a pretty good machine. Well, we can do that. We can turn afflictions into blessings. Now, uh, now when I talk about suffering, it's because I know a great deal about it. (laughs) 
I've got a PhD in suffering, afflictions. And uh, well, it, it always makes me laugh when I hear people say, yeah, that, I just don't want to get, you know, fully invested into ministry because if I do that, I know the devil's going to get upset and he's going to attack and I'm going to have a bunch of trials and afflictions. As if living far from God doesn't bring you afflictions? What kind of insane logic is that? When the Bible says whether you build your house on the rock or you build it on the sand, it's the same hurricane winds that hits both. It's just a small little difference. This, the, on the sand, it says it's, it's destroyed. It is a great ruin, it says in, in Spanish. I don't remember the exact words in English, but it is... It's just, it's great destruction. And here it stands. So that little small distinction of suffering with God and without God makes a huge difference. It's the difference between hope and being able to suffer well and uh, crumble, completely crumble. So today I want to give you a formula, all right? You taking notes? You guys taking notes? You have your, 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 your you know, Okay, all the men have their secretaries. And, <laughs> don't do that, men. Come on, you take notes. Take notes so that you can remember this because this is, this is a formula I'm going to give you. And if you follow this formula, I don't care what kind of trial you go through, you can convert it. It doesn't have to just be pain. You can convert it into blessings. But the first thing you have to do is welcome the suffering. That's the first step. You just got to welcome it. We're in Acts 16. Let's, let's remember the context. Paul, with his missionary team, is wanting to go somewhere, and God gives him a vision saying, hey, 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 I'm going to change your plans. Let's deviate. Let's go to Philippi. Okay? So he comes to Philippi, and he starts preaching, and there's this girl following him around uh, who's demon-possessed, and uh, a lot of rich and powerful men of the city are taking advantage of her. Does that sound like our days? Rich and powerful men using young women for gain. And so uh, he does a good thing. He helps her. He heals her. He gets that demon. Now they're upset because they've lost their income. And so they beat these guys and they throw them into jail. That's where we are right now. So verses 23 and 24 says, And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison. Now, I don't know why that detail matters, like the inner prison. I guess it's the coldest, the darkest one. And so he cast them and made their feet fast in the stocks. So the first thing you have to do is just understand, yep, that sounds about right. You're serving God, and the enemy's not going to stay quiet. You're going to suffer. While you're in this world, Jesus said it. But he also said, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I beat it. So just, just be with me. Stick with me. But don't get angry when trials come. Don't lose your head when you, you, you start going through tribulation. Don't be surprised. Because that's the typical reaction of all Christians when suffering comes. Why me, God? Why me? Well, are you a human being? <laughs> are you on earth? Are you a child of God? Are you serving him? Yeah, you're going to have afflictions. That's a guarantee. But the problem is we're so scared of suffering that we'll do anything to avoid it. We avoid it like the plague. And I think that's where the enemy gets us the most, is in through fear. Now, in 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now, I, I always read that, just, just read it through, you know, since, since I'm a third generation missionary. Um, we grew up with the Bible as a kid. I mean, I got saved when I was four years old in two months. Four years old in two months because my mom would read, you know, Kenneth N. Taylor's uh, uh, Scripture for Little Eyes or what's it called? Does anyone know? Anyway. Uh, <laughs> It's like a little Bible for kids. And uh, one night I just asked a bunch of questions about hell, did not want to go there. And she answered them and we knelt by the bed and, and I received Jesus as my personal savior that night in Akron, Ohio. 
And, uh, and, and so there's, there's sometimes, I mean, that's a great advantage in life, but also you just, you just read scripture sometimes and don't pay attention. And it wasn't until just a few years ago where I looked at it and I said, there's something wrong with that. The devil as a roaring lion is seeking whom he may devour. Uh, I don't know if it's because we got a cat in the pandemic. I know the world's divided into two, dog people and cat people. Usually I'm team dog. All my life I've been team dog. I've never had a cat, so I don't know why I always dog them until you get one. Oh, my goodness. I love it. There's a picture of our cat. Now, I love the way he's just so cool, isn't he? It's like the cats, because I, I love big cats. I love lions and tigers. But it's like, I remember when that, I saw him like that, just laying on the couch or something, and having the, that paw down there, he's just like, he looked like, I don't know, it's like Dean, you know, um, just, just so cool. And it's just, I just, it reminded me of the Jungle Book, you know, the, the panther, <laughs> just, just laying there on the, on the branch, and, and he's like, I got a mini lion in my house. <laughs> I thought it was the coolest thing. Now, when I would have discipleship on our patio, on our, uh, it's like on the second floor, there was this like this little uh, um, patio, is that what you would call it? And so, huh? Roof garden? Okay, roof guard. Ooh, that sounds even more sophisticated. I like it. So we had a roof garden. And I would have discipleship through the pandemic in the roof garden because, you know, it's like, yeah, I got to be outside, you know, because if you breathe the air and, it's, and, and everything. And so uh, I would see Kovu all of a sudden just be super quiet, sit there. And it's like, what, what, is, what is he doing? until we would be in the house and he brought us a couple of offerings. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Yes. Now, I don't know how a cat can catch a bird. How stupid of a bird do you have to be? <laughs> you got wings, okay? Just fly away. He, doesn't, he, can't, he can't follow you. How do you let yourself be caught? It's it just, I don't understand it until you see some videos. Look, let, let, let's see a couple of videos here and how they, 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 they approach. Now, look at that. I mean, that's a pretty big lion, and he's crouching down. Now, do you see how he's roaring? What? He's not roaring, but the Bible says it. As a roaring liar, li uh, lion, he seeks to devour. Where's the roar? They're quiet, sneaking up through the blind spot, and oh, you're done. Yeah, yeah, I I'll stop it. I'll stop it right there. <laughs> Don't worry. There's another minute of video, but we won't see that. Uh, <laughs> go to the next video, please. And there we have it. I said, Okay, I gotta see how these cats do it. Now, I don't know if you can see, there's this little black bird on top of that flower in there. Look at this. Boom, he got it. He got, look at that. He was roaring, right? Okay, so either Peter never watched National Geographic. <laughs> he doesn't know what he's talking about when it comes to lions, or this lion doesn't hunt the same way as the real lions hunt. Because if you think about it, the devil cannot devour us. He can't. I mean, even with Job, he's like, okay, you can, don't touch him though. Okay, touch him, but you can't kill him. I mean, he cannot devour us on will. So why does it say as a roaring lion, he devours us? Because we let ourselves be devoured. Because the roar brings fear into us. And what kills Christian more than anything else is fear. Because it's the opposite of faith. You either have faith or you have fear. You can't. They don't go together. I'm talking about fear of circumstances and of men. I'm not talking about fear of the Lord. That's, that's a whole different kind of fear. 
But <laughs> there's a reason why Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God had not given us the spirit of what? Why didn't he say fear of, I don't know, uh, um, um, you know, materialism, riches, uh, or, or lust? Because I think lust is probably the biggest problem of, of humans. But he says he's not giving us a spirit of a, a fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. Fear. Why did he, he focus on fear? Because that's how he devours us, roaring. Let me illustrate it with this, and it's going to be sealed in your mind. I have a friend, a pastor friend down there in Mexico City, and he has three boys. And the youngest is seven years old, and he says, when I play hide and seek with them, you know, and he's so competitive. I mean, us pastors, we are, right? We're very competitive. And so he's like, I'm not going to lose. He's like, he's like the father of a seven-year-old, but he doesn't care. I am not losing to that stinker. And sometimes he trumps me. I don't know how he does it. He finds a high spot and I can't find him. And I look everywhere and I can't find him. So what does he do? I see you. Oh, I'm coming for you right now. He starts screaming. He roars. And what does the little kid do? Oh, oh. And so he, he moves and now he loses. Did, did we get it? That's how he devours us. And if the pandemic was proof of anything is how little faith do we as the people of God have? We cave in so quick to fear, don't we? But if you learn to welcome the fear, it's eliminated. If you learn to welcome the suffering, you don't have fear. Now make sure you suffer for doing good because in 1 Peter it says, you know, what glory is it if you be buffeted for your faults you shall take it patiently. But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, that means you, you accept it and you make through it, you go through it, this is acceptable with God. Now, I hate this next line. I wish we could scratch it out. For even hereunto were ye called. You know, Christians, we don't get it. We have a calling. I'm just waiting for, you know, the calling of the Lord. And we just, we only see the positive side and all oh, the calling of the Lord. Yeah, he called me to this. Now, gee, I mean, God called Mary. Did she, did he not? He chose her over all their women. Now, I don't know you, but I'm thinking if I'm chosen, I didn't look for it, but he chose me to bring his son, God in flesh, man. I got it made. I mean, I'm going to be on a king-size bed giving birth with the spa music in the background, <laughs> right? I mean, this is God's child. He's the king of kings. Oh, man, if he called me, he chose me. I didn't look for it. He chose me. I'm going to have a beautiful birth. Yeah, no. You're going to be laying on the floor of the public bathroom in the parking lot. That's, I think where our anger many times comes is that we have unrealistic or unmet expectations as to what we think God's calling is gonna look like. Now I come, I, I put myself in Paul's shoes. It's like, okay, I was going here, we had a great plan. You're the one who deviated us, so let's go over here then. All right, I'm thinking you call me to Philippi, there's going to be a stadium full of people ready to hear the gospel. Amen? Come on, isn't that what we would naturally think? Yeah. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting in a dark cell. Yeah, a lot of preaching happening here. What is going on, God? I mean, this is kind of ridiculous. You know, I'm, what am I supposed to preach the gospel of Silas? He's already saved. You are saved, right? <laughs> you know where you're going if you die, right? Yeah, okay. Just checking. I'm not being very fruitful sitting here in a jail cell. I should be out there preaching. You get what I'm, where I'm coming from? We hate suffering. We don't see the purpose for the pain. And we forget God always has a purpose. And your pain has a purpose. And he's going to work it for, for good. 
but we don't see that. And so, uh, but that's where we have to, by faith, just learn to welcome the suffering. That's the first step. Just got to welcome it. Oh, my goodness. I mean, now for the first time, I was going to get on time for the discipleship at 9 o'clock, and the, and, and the car broke down, you know, a flat tire. Come on, man. What? And, it, and it isn't it like life that right when you start making the best of decisions, it's when it, everything goes against you the most? Okay, so what do you do? You welcome it. Number two, just worship your Savior in it. Worship your Savior in the midst of it. Because when you have been thrown a curveball, it's like, I, I don't get it. I don't understand what you're doing here, God. The best way to center yourself and get where you need to be is just start worshiping him. Okay, let me, let, let me flesh it out here. Acts 16, 25, it says, And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. He's prayed and sang praises. I like it better in Spanish. I'm sorry. But in Spanish it says, and praying they sang praises. Singing praises is a form of prayer. Now think of it, Psalms. I mean, Psalms. What is David doing, or, or and all those authors in Psalms, what are they doing? Speaking to God. What is speaking to God? Prayer. But they're Psalms. They're Psalms. You get that? So I, I can't stand when I hear members of my church, and I'm sure it doesn't happen here, <laughs> saying, you know, they arrive late, but at least they came for the best part, the preaching. And it's like, well, the church is a house of prayer. And what you don't get is from the start at 11 sharp, we are praying, 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 worshiping, praying, praying, praying to prepare our hearts to hear the message and take it as word of God, not word of man. And even if man does, you know, <laughs> um, put a little uh, of man into it, you as good Christians are supposed to, uh, what's, the, what's the English biblical word of, of, of taking the wheat and beating it? The threshing? Well, you're supposed to throw out the weed and keep the wheat. You know, that's what we're supposed to do. So sometimes, yeah, as man, we'll say dumb things. But you're supposed to, I don't know where the word, but weed through it and, and, and find the grain. And if you have prepared your heart through prayer and worship the whole time, you're going to get less offended. And I promise you, those who get most offended are probably the ones who aren't there from the beginning worshiping and praying. They're not preparing their hearts. Prayer is powerful. And singing is soothing. And sometimes what you have to do when you're in the jail cell and you don't understand, I don't get it. I don't see why. What, what are you doing? This doesn't make sense. You're wasting on my time and my effort and my energy sitting in a cell when I could be out there preaching. Come on, God. So when you start praying, you're talking to him because he says, cast your cares to him, right? So cast them. Take advantage of it. Talk to him about it. I know David sounds like he's a whiny baby in the Psalms, but why is it that we love reading the Psalms? Because we identify. So whine to God. Talk to him. And then there's sometimes, does it not happen to you? Where you just have to start singing and praising him. And it's like, our God is an awesome God. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. And you're just singing, you remind yourself, God's good. He's my savior. He redeemed me. He gives me peace. He knows what he's doing. He's in control. And when you just praise him and you just sing to him, you know, uh, um, oh, there's so many songs that come to my head, I can't even sing one. But when you start singing, you start praising him, 
it centers you and it reminds you. He knows what he's doing even though you don't. Just trust him. Now, praying and seeing are important weapons of evangelism. Evangelism? Yeah, I'm going to get to that in the third point. But it says he was, they were praying and singing, and the prisoners heard them. Just, 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 just keep that little phrase in, in, in the back of your mind, and I'll get to it. But worship helps us win our spiritual battle. We are in a spiritual warfare. And what happens, I mean, there's a reason why King David was the best. And even though he did the worst of stuff, he did much worse than Saul did, but he is the line that the Savior goes through David. And what prepared him for warfare, no one like David on the battlefield, and I believe it was worship that prepared him for war. Now, it sounds crazy, but when you study out the Scots, the Scots had a division of their military that were just playing bagpipes. They would go to war and literally there'd be a whole chorus just playing bagpipes. And that would fire up the Scots. So they had the, the archers, they had the, uh, you know, the foot soldiers, they had the, 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 the cavalry, and they had the pipers. I mean, imagine. Yeah, I'm a soldier. Yeah, what division? I'm the piper. <laughs> doesn't sound very sexy to me, you know. It doesn't sound, doesn't sound very strong and something you would, you know, <laughs> um, be bragging about. But did you know that the bagpipes were considered a martial instrument? A marsh, like martial arts? Yeah, that's war. Yeah, martial instrument. Now, I don't know you, but I'm thinking if there's an instrument that's going to get us pumped up to go to war, I mean, that's the drums, right? Well, that's the electric guitar. Yeah. I don't think of bagpipes. Bagpipes seem a little wimpy to me. You know, it's like, oh, it doesn't. I, I don't know. It doesn't register with me. But look at Psalms. Psalms 149 says, let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. And I never understood that until the pandemic. <laughs> sing on their beds, right? <laughs> let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. It's war. Singing, right there. Singing is related to war. And if you see 2 Corinthians, no, Corinthians, Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, was it Jehoshaphat or Hezekiah? Jehoshaphat, right? He won a war with choir. That seems crazy to me. I imagine, okay, guys, we're going to face war again. All of a sudden, obviously, the big buff swordsmen come out, you know, they start, <sighs> yeah, we're going to war. All right, let's pray. Ba, ba, ba. Bah! The archers, you know, they're stretching. Oh, wow. oh, wow. Here comes the king. Uh, no, guys, sit down, sit down, sit down. Where are my tenors? Tenors? <laughs> sopranos. Come on, come on, Sopranos. Let's go, let's go. We're going to war now. And, and all these big buff guys, you know, they're sitting down. What? What's going on? And these little scorny guys like, yes. Me, 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 mama, me. All right, let's go to war. What? And all they did was sing as a choir, and they all died. I mean, it's amazing. It's crazy to me. And I, I, you, 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 you read that, and it's like, that just seems so, you know, far-fetched until you hear stories like, like the Mad Piper, Bill Millen. Did you, did you guys watch the beginning of Saving Private Ryan? Yeah? Some? No? For some, that's too unholy? I don't know. <laughs> but when I saw that, I mean, that was the first time I was like, how did anyone make it alive on the beach? Man, you've got bullets flying everywhere. It's just, it was like, 
How did not everyone just get wiped out? It's amazing to me. You know what's even crazier? His CEO, <laughs> Bill Millen, CEO, also with Scott, says, okay, guys, um, Bill, put down the rifle. I want you to take the bio pipes. We're going to hit the beach. And I want you to stand there, and I want you to play classic Scottish songs. This is real, okay? This is not fantasy. He put down the rifle and was like, um, sir, the English army has forbidden the playing of bagpipes. Yeah, but we're Scots, so it doesn't apply to us. <laughs> That's literally what he said. This is history. So <laughs> Bill Millen, I can't, I can't fathom all that, that those shooting of, of saving Private Ryan and this guy running, <laughs> dodging bullets and getting to the beach and just standing there. <laughs> Staying there and playing like four songs. When they captured the beach, they talked to Nazi snipers. They say, yeah, we saw him. We didn't shoot him because we just thought he was crazy. <laughs> this is history. I'm telling you. And I don't even have time. I would love to talk to you about Mad Jack Churchill whose motto was any officer who goes into action without his sword is improperly dressed. And he meant that literally because this is a picture of Magic Churchill with a Scottish broadsword. He went into World War II with tanks, with all these weapons, and he's carrying a sword. He was the first soldier of the British Army who killed Nazis with a longbow. He never shot. He, he, he played the bagpipes and threw grenades. <laughs> Worship is powerful. Don't underestimate music. Don't ask, underestimate worship and praise and prayer. When you're in a situation, you don't understand the way you get centered and just like calm your mind and you get it centered to really being able to react the way God wants and not the way we would is through worship. So when you're in that situation, just start singing. Just start singing your favorite praise songs. Crank it up and just start listening and reading it. And, and you might start crying. That happens to me. Or sometimes you're just, God, you're awesome, and everything like that. And I'm going through stuff where it's like, you, it, you don't feel awesome right now. But, but you're awesome, and I know that, and I declare it by faith, although I don't feel it. And so you can be crying your eyes out, but you're praising him, and it's centering you, and it's, you're worshiping. And during the pandemic, my son and I, Eric and I, we, we wrote two new praise songs that as a church we sing. One is called, you know, um, I Live by Faith. And the other one is, I will trust in you. And through the pandemic, Zoom became very, very uh, important. And living in one of the largest cities in the world, you just can't get together so often, many times. But Zoom has made, opened up doors. We never had Sunday evening services because some people drive an hour and a half to get to church. You think they're going to go home and just come right back? Never have we. But now we have Sunday evening service. Zoom. And it's just a time of testimonies. We don't sing because, let's be honest, through Zoom, you know, praying uh, music is just not, doesn't come out of the same. But we just give testimonies. So how did God speak to you in the morning? And we just connect and it just bonds us as a family. And then I'm able to use my leaders to preach and hone their skills during those evening times. And we started praying every day from Friday to from Monday to Friday, every morning from 8 to 9 a.m., we're on Zoom. And it's like, I would say 80% of our church are connected every morning praying together. And that's how we start the day. With a Bible challenge from 7:30 to 8, just like a just a mindset, just to get us mentalized as and focused, and then we pray. And that's it. We just pray. And sometimes you don't pray because you don't get the chance because uh, this brother took up 40 minutes. <laughs> it's okay. We just pray together. From eight to nine, we just pray. Now we have to divide it into two rooms because there are too many people. Is that awesome? 
Okay, I guess it's not as awesome to you as it is to me. <laughs> eh. No, you're just looking at the time that I need to start looking at. Oh, I thought it was back. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Number three, and this is, this is the most important step or in the formula. Witness to sinners. Witness to sinners. This is going to knock your socks off. I love this part. Now, I'm not going to read it all. Let's just remember basically how the story goes. They're praying, and they're doing this, and then all of a sudden, an earthquake comes. It opens the doors. I don't know how an earthquake will undo shackles, but it did. And uh, they're freed, and they could all run. And so the jailer's like, oh, my goodness, they're escaped. They're going to kill me. Might as well kill myself. And Paul screams out, no, don't do anything. We're all here. I'm sure that, you know, that, that typical kid in school that is that, oh, you just hate him. You know, it's like, okay, we, the teacher didn't ask for the homework. And that kid, um, a teacher, aren't you going to ask us about our homework? <laughs> and they're like, shut up. So Paul's like, no, no, we're all here, right, guys? And they're like, oh, man, I was hiding. <laughs> and then he comes shaking, it says, shaking, trembling. He comes and kneels before Paul and Silas and he says, sirs, what do I need to do to get saved? Now, I don't know about Pastor Scott or Pastor Scott, <laughs> but me, Scott, <laughs> I've never had an unsaved person just walk up to me, say, Pastor, what do I do, need to do to get saved? That would be awesome. Now, how did that happen? That doesn't happen. On its own. I'll tell you how it happened. This is how I think it happened. I granted, I can't prove it. But it says they prayed and they sang praises, and the prisoners heard them. And I think he heard something. But I think the kicker, this is my opinion. I think the kicker was how Paul reacted in the trial. That's what convinced him there's something different, and I need that. I think it's how we react in trials. Now, I'm going to step on some toes here. I'm sorry. I'm not, I, it's not my desire to do that. But the unsaved are watching you. They're watching us. Do they see stress and anxiety and worry in us? If so, we're doing a poor job of representing? Or do they say joy, peace, the fruit of the Spirit? Because supposedly if we're saved, we should react differently than those who do not have hope. Amen. Right? Amen. I mean, come on. Are we hiding in our houses like them? Are we too scared to step outside like those who have no hope? That seems ridiculous to me that we'd be so scared to die being Christians because we can't die. Okay, let me say that again because it hasn't sunk into your head yet. We cannot die. We already passed from death to life. That's what John 5 says. So Christians cannot die. We just relocate. Come on. That was a good phrase. Why aren't you writing this down? Take notes. I'm giving you a formula here. This is turning trash into gold. Who wouldn't want that formula? Hebrews 10 says that we, we endure affliction as a spectacle, but call to the remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions. Partly, why? Why do I have to suffer? Partly, whilst you were made a gazing stock both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst he became companions of them that were so used. So there are two reasons. No, number one, <coughs> it's so that you can minister to others and you know what they're going through and how they feel because you've gone through it. But the other is, is you are the show, okay? You're a spectacle. God has a circus and you are the main attraction, doesn't it say the same in 2 Corinthians? That we are a spectacle? That angels and the unsaved in the world are watching us? We are the show. So what kind of show are you giving them? 
Sometimes, and I understand this, through the pandemic, I mean, I beat cancer three times, and then in the pandemic, it was all about COVID, COVID. COVID was not my problem. COVID was not my problem. My problem is they discovered five autoimmune diseases during the pandemic. I've got now neuropathies. My feet are on fire. I have lightning shows going on all the time. So now they've drugged me so much to not feel that, but I'm like a zombie. Yeah, I don't feel it, but man, it's hard to even walk downstairs. It's like everything's a little shaky. It's like not all focused and clean and clear. And, and, and that, all that struggle. We came up to Houston uh, to, to see specialists because there are meds that they have now banned or boycotted in Mexico, and I can't get them, only in the state, so you have to get into the system and had wounds. I, I, I could show you, but I don't want to disgust you. But it looked like they'd taken a shotgun and just shot big holes in my legs. And it just, it would ooze. It would just, it, it, they don't even know what it is. It's, like, it's a vasculitis, but I've never seen anything like this. Now, why, God? Why would you? I'm a black belt. I'm a black belt, a second-degree black belt in Taekwondo. I say I am because I technically still am, but I was. I'm not anymore. I'm serious. It's been 15, 20 years since I've done any of that activity because I've been battling with health for 20 years now. I know what it is to sit in a wheelchair and not be able to get out. I know what it is to be in bed two months. I did not see the new year in 2008. I had a bunch of pastors in my house and we celebrated the new year and then they had to pick me up and carry me to my room because I couldn't get off the couch. And I didn't see outside of my bedroom until March 2009. And it's like, it can get to the point I understand what suffering is, and you get to the point where you're like, okay, I know everything is to learn a lesson. I, I, I'm changing my character. I'm not doing this. I'm doing that. I mean, you do so many adjustments, and you're like, I don't know what else to adjust. <laughs> what more are you trying to teach me? And it dawns on me. The world doesn't revolve around you. You're not the sun. Could it be? That sometimes God allows suffering just as a tool to evangelize those who are watching me? Could it be that he allows your cat to be run over, your car to break down, your house to burn down, and your neighbor is like, man, I would eat a bullet. I would throw myself off a bridge at this point. And to see you, even with tears, walking to church on Sunday, I'm going to go to church and I'm going to praise the Lord. And the unsaved are watching. Your neighbor's watching. He's like, are you kidding me? How can you keep doing praising him? If he's in control, that's pretty much of a jerk that allowed all that in your life. How can you keep praising him? Could it be? That God, like with Job, hey, Satan, have you considered Job? Man, he's such an awesome guy. Yeah, well, we get Okay, so the whole book of Job is just because God wanted to show Satan how awesome Job was. That's it. Could it be that sometimes our suffering is just to show the unbeliever what hope and faith looks like? And so I wonder, are we acting, are we reacting the same way they are? I, I, I got to be honest. Sometimes, and maybe it's because, you know, I'm, I have my flesh. Maybe I'm too judgy. But when I hear pastors get up and say that they went to the doctor and he said, the doctor said that the reason I am going through this physical ailment, it's stress related. It drives me nuts. It drives me nuts. How can you let circumstances make you worry to the point where you affect your body? You break your body over thoughts. And you're the preacher, you're the pastor? Come on, man. I mean, how would you think if I said, man, I'm sorry if I say something a little weird or off. I'm so tired. I stayed up all night watching porn. And so I didn't get a lot of sleep, but let's, let's go to the word of God and see what he has to say for us today. 
Would you accept that? Oh, but we can completely disregard and disobey God's word where he says, be anxious for nothing. Cast all your cares upon me. And he's obviously not doing that. And don't get me wrong. It's scientifically proven. Being a pastor is one of the most stressed related jobs on the face of this earth. That's a fact. But if we're doing it in the flesh, I mean, come on. How can I break my body over thoughts because I'm worrying? That's, that's a blatant disobedience and goes completely against all that Christ represents. Are, are we getting my drift here? And I'm, and I'm talking about the pastors, but, you know, members are Christians too. How can we be pill-popping over stress? Come on. Where is prayer then? Well, we're not doing it. And we certainly aren't trusting God. Paul was more worried about saving the jailer's life than his own comfort or safety. Is that how he reacted during COVID? I mean, if we're scared over virus, how do you think people who don't know what's happening after, after death, they have no hope for eternity, how do you think they're feeling? And don't, shouldn't they see something different in us? I'll tell you who's scared to die, okay? Those who are scared to die are those who do not live for Jesus Christ. Those Christians who are so scared, oh, I don't want to die, it's because you're too scared to face your Savior because you know you've done nothing. But if you're totally giving over to serving God and ministering his word, I promise you nothing appeals you more than going and being now and in his presence. Paul said it, right? Paul said it. I say, I would rather go. I, but man, if he's going to leave me here, I, it's because I still need to minister to you guys. But man, I would rather be up there. I'd rather leave. I've heard of Christians uh, and, and pastors and, and, and worship leaders who have died and, uh, of cancer and other things. And I got to tell you, sometimes I'm jealous. I was like, I've had cancer three times. I never asked for him to heal me because, not that it's a sin to do so, but I don't want to tell God what to do with me. I'm, I, I, have you ever played chess? Have you ever played chess? You know chess? It's all about the king winning. That's all, all you care about is the king winning. That's all I care about. So yeah, you're going to have to sacrifice some pieces in order for the king to win. I'm just a piece in the puzzle. I don't care what happens to me. Whatever brings more glory, that's all I want. I don't understand sometimes why I'm going through what I'm going through because I feel like I studied, I got my bachelor's degree in physical education, second degree black belt. I'm a very physical athletic person and it's like I'm a lion who knows how to hunt and I'm encaged. I feel limited. But that's our, that's our human logic. Could it be that our weakness is the source of our superpower? And what we think limits us is actually what God uses to bless others? Uh, Pastor Alan Shelby does the church know him in, in Kansas City? He, he was a spokesman from LFF, from Living Faith Fellowship. He, was, uh, he spoke at, uh, last year to our uh, online uh, Zima conference. It's where we celebrate missions. And usually it's like we get all the churches together to celebrate missions in a huge way. It's like the mother load of mission conferences. It's like missions conference on stairs. And so through the pandemic, we had to do it through Zoom, and he was one of the speakers. And I'll never forget what he said. It's like, we want to be these pots that are so beautiful and excellently structured. But then if we are so perfect, then the treasure that is in us, like 1 Corinthians 4 says, it can't shine. And we're so upset about our brokenness and our grietas, um, Cracks, thank you, that 
we feel bad about our cracks, and those are those things that we feel limit us and make us look ugly. But it could be, could it be that without those cracks, the light can't shine through? So God uses those cracks. Does that make sense? Isn't that an awesome thought? Changed everything of what I think. And I know I'm past my time, but there's a fourth step, and it's important to, you need to learn to wait on God's solution. Paul didn't run. He didn't escape. He walked through the steps trusting God. We want to run away from our trials instead of face them. But young people, do we have young people here? Still in school. When the teacher comes with that final exam, puts down the test. If you as a student say, uh, teacher, can you take my test away, please? Okay. But what grade are you going to get? F. You flunked. Now you got to repeat the year. Could it be that's why we have Christians that are like 25 years in the faith and they're still babies because they never passed their test? Because what do we do? First thing, trial, cancer, church, church, I've got a prayer request. I've got cancer. Could we please pray that God take the cancer away? Oh, it got silent now. Is that the right way to react? Why do we run away? Why do we want the test to be taken away so quickly? I'm going through this situation. They're suing me. Can we please just pray that this goes away? John chapter 12, Jesus says, what, am I going to ask for this hour not to be? This is the reason why I came for this hour, for this moment. Father, glorify your name. Ah, that's how we should pray. Not take my cancer away, heal me. God, whatever you choose to do, I will accept. Just help me glorify your name in this trial. I think we pray wrong. I think we react wrong many times. Paul, get this. I mean, this, this should be a movie. Oh, man. Dallas Jenkins has done such a great job with The Chosen. I don't know if you guys like it. We love it. But he should do this part, too. Because this, I think there's some comical scenes in here. And there's some really awesome scenes. I mean, first of all, he comes here. What do I have to do? Well, believe in God and you'll be saved in all your household. Let me take you home to my household. In the night, he takes him to his house, and it says he starts cleaning his wounds. Now, that would be awesome, right? I mean, imagine he's like, ah, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, I know, I know, I know. I, 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 I hit you way too hard in that one. The guy who put the stripes on him is now washing those stripes. Now, come on, that's just, is that not a beautiful scene? That, that could be comical there. He's washing him, bathing him. So after a spa night and a beautiful buffet and a great evangelistic campaign where everyone in the house gets saved, then they have baptisms. And after all that, I don't think it ever clicked in my head until I studied this out. They go back. And he sits back in his jail cell and they close the door. That never clicked to me. After a beautiful night, it's like, well, the guards are going to come. We better get back in there ourselves. They go back, voluntarily sit down, and get locked up again. Now, I don't know you, but I'm thinking, God answered my prayer. I was praying. He opened the door. Silas, let's go. I mean, there's another part where in the Bible there was an earthquake that opened up the cell, and that was of God, and he left. Right? Why not see that as God's solution? And this is where I want to submit to you another thought. Most times, Satan presents us with the first escape out of the trial, but it's a false escape. Satan never presents anything bad or evil. Study the Bible. He never presents something bad or wrong. Right, like the enemy, man, he's, like, he, that, he's using that secretary to tempt me at work. That's not Satan. That's your flesh. Satan doesn't do that. You know what Satan does? Satan gives you something good. Satan gives you what God wants to give you. but in the wrong moment and the wrong way. Come on, you're going to be like God. You're going to be wise. 
eat the fruit. Did God want them to be like him? Yes, but with him. Satan, be like him without him. See what I'm saying? Joshua, let's not fight. Let's not fight, man. Let's do an alliance of peace. You hear me? That's beautiful. It's not what God wanted. He disobeyed God. Jesus, come on, man. It's been 40 days. Eat some bread, man. Take care of yourself. All these kingdoms, they're yours. I'll give them to you, man. Isn't that what God wants? Yeah, but not kneeling down to him. Not that way, not that time. Do you get what I'm saying here? That's how Satan comes. He bombards you with all these trials and hits, and you're like, ah, and he says, come on, here's a door. Don't, don't take all that, just get out. And there's a cliff to your death. Uh, let, let me give you an example of this. You've heard this. I lost my job, pastor, let's pray for me. I'm, I'm unemployed. Now, while he's unemployed, he's so faithful to church. He's like reading the Bible like never before, right? <laughs> pastor, you can see in this? Faithful to the Bible, studying everything. And then the first job opportunity comes. I want to give him Thanksgiving. God answered your prayers. Thank you for praying. He gave me a new job. How do you know that was God and not Satan? Why do you automatically assume that that was God? That's crazy. Well, because I'm providing, I'm, I'm being able to fulfill the scriptures with my family. Yes, that's what Satan does. He presents you with what God wants, but not the moment or not that way. Because then they take that job, no longer come on Sunday because they're working. You think that was God who gave you that job? Give me a break. Come on, come on. Paul trusted God, not circumstances, to solve his problem. Man, I had a free passage. The doors just open. I didn't do anything. I can just walk freely. So why did he stay? Because he's thinking of the jailer. If I leave, they kill him. Do you see that? And because... He trusted God and followed God's lead, which again is crazy to me. I want you to go over there and preach. And I'm sitting in a cell, okay? Not a lot of preaching I'm going to be able to do from here. But then because he worships, I'm going to just center myself. God, you're good. You know what you're doing. I love you. I praise you. You're awesome. And all of a sudden, it shakes and everything. Hey, hey no, we're, we're all here. Don't worry about it. He reacts in the spirit, not in the flesh, because I would have just bolted. I'm free. No, 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 don't kill yourself. We're all here. And it leads to his salvation. And what is baptism for? What is baptism for? What? So your salvation is a public testimony? Yes. What else? It's, it's to kill your flesh and its desires, symbolically. Yes, what else? What else? What? A picture of the death, yes. What else? Why are we baptized? Was yes. Yes, we already said that. <laughs> what? Who said that right? Oh, Gloria, come on. <laughs> no, Jenny. Okay, go ahead. No one's saying it. Hello. We're baptized into the membership of a church. Okay, you're not catching on. That is the night where the Philippian church was established. Oh, come on. The church is the hope of the world. A church was begun that night. They were baptized. They were the founding members of the Philippian church. One of the best New Testament churches there was. It all began that night. So if he wouldn't have been in jail, he wouldn't have talked to that jailer, the Philippian church would never have been. I don't know you, but... I cannot imagine this Bible without Philippians. It's got some of the best verses in it, does it not? Oh, come on. Philippians 4.13. 
I can do all things. That's the Superman verse. Oh, my goodness. That's the Superman verse. I can do all things. Philippians 1, 6. What? That's, that's 419. That's 419. That's an awesome verse, dude. I love that verse. What else? Uh, uh, Philippians 1, 6. Come on. He who began... He's going to finish it. Oh, what a great verse. Philippians 2, oh, 3 and 4, humility. And then 5, have the same mindset of Jesus who didn't, you know, stay in heaven, but he came down. He took the form of, of his servant, was obedient to the cross, to, to death and to the death of the cross. And, and then he, he's right. Oh, come on. What a passage, right? And then Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Oh, come on. This is like... Be anxious for nothing, or how does it say it in, in, in English? I don't remember, but it, basically, but pray, thanksgiving, and the peace of God. It's above all understanding. I mean, that is, what verse? None of that would exist. Had Paul just not walked through the steps, <laughs> yeah, okay, we're serving God, we're in prison, yeah? Let's just, let's just sing, let's just center our minds, let's just worship him, get our head together so that we're in the right place. Boom, all this happens. He's led by the Spirit. His whole family is saved, baptized. The Philippian church is established that night. What a blessing. It came out of afflictions because he just followed this formula. Did you write it down? It's a great formula. The next time you go through afflictions, just remember, welcome it, don't lose your head. Just pray and sing for a while and look for the opportunity to be a witness to the lost. Use your afflictions and suffering to witness and give others the hope and strength that you have because of your faith. They need it. Let's give it to them and just walk through the steps trusting God will give you the solution. You don't have to make it happen. Just follow him and he will make it happen. And, and just pray for us because the church is the hope of the world. I believe that. And that's why we're church planners. And we want to start 16 churches in the 16 townships of Mexico City. It's a vision. I don't know if I'm going to see it while I'm alive, but it is certainly something I want to do. And we want to start the next one soon. So be praying, please. Dear Heavenly Father, I know I took too long. but.